a beginning. I woke feeling the muted chill of an early January morning in Edinburgh. Outside, the snow glowed in the dark, still and impervious. I joined Jacob's yoga class on screen, a recording of him practicing and teaching alone on Tinningham Beach, the waves breaking behind him during what appeared to be summer. Being with him and others I couldn't see, all of us online, them at the time and me now catching up, called forth the elusive distant ocean and the elusive distant experience of being close to others, other human bodies. Later, I ran over icy pavements, taking care not to slip, moving onto the road where the pavement became treacherous. I took a longer route to avoid the roads and pavements less likely to have been gritted. I missed turnings and was slow to reach the park and the outdoor gym equipment. I stood under the high bars and looked south to Edinburgh Castle, hazy in the mist. I lifted myself till my eyes reached over the bar. I couldn't complete as many lifts as usual. I knew why. Later in the afternoon, I slept. The regret, the loss, flooring me. Maybe this is grief, I thought. Maybe this is what grief feels like. This is what this grief feels like. Now, I write. I say write. I am talking, dictating. That's how I often write now. Talking here into my laptop at home or talking into my phone as I walk, move through these pandemic second British lockdown days. I walk to think and to feel, to be moved, to be free from the screen. I walk, talk to write. I pause. I pause to breathe. I close my eyes and pay attention to what's taking place in my body. Breathe again. I feel my chest expand and compress. I feel the stiffness in my neck to the left. It's always there and the tightness in my jaw. I listen. The heating breathes with me. I open my eyes. The wireless router flashes two green lights as it processes my dictating. I'm speaking to the router. The router is my audience, my companion in writing. I don't feel a reader, a listener with me. Not yet, not today. My rib cage vibrates as I speak aloud to the empty room, to the router. I stop talking to check the accuracy of what's emerging on the screen on the screen and begin typing to correct. The green lights stop flashing. I claim this writing as creative relational inquiry, an inquiry open to fluid, dynamic, forceful, hyphenated human and more than human encounters open to how we are always in the midst, in process, engaged, affecting and affected, and for better and worse, always infecting and being infected, contaminating and being contaminated, always already given over to the other, always becoming other. Contamination is a condition of being alive. We are irrepressibly, irresistibly relational, porous and leaky, conditioned by the encounters with multiple human and non-human bodies. We are given life by, depend upon our mutual contagion. Con, together, tagion, tangere, touch. How we touch each other, how we affect each other, how bodies are affected and affect others. Contagion is endemic, not epidemic. A creative relational inquiry, writes Dan Harris, might be so small as to be imperceptible to the human eye, 
but it might also simultaneously be so big that whole universes exist within, between, and through it. So here, I follow Harris as I write into the everyday, all but imperceptible of living, walking, and walking, talking, writing in this pandemic time. The small and the slow of an Edinburgh lockdown fluttering into writing and poetic life, while around, within and beyond, there is the multiplicity of the small, vast and fast of a virus. I keep faith in how the act of writing might make it possible to fathom human and more than human connections and disconnections to create the intimate within a universe, to create the intimate with and a universe, to find creative relational connections with and between the everyday of this shrunken time. I search for the stories of these few weeks of an Edinburgh lockdown winter and spring, its struggles, its losses, its moments of contact, I inquire into the everyday of how the pandemic is laying its mark, changing the way we think, reorienting us to what is and isn't possible, affecting and infecting, contaminating, how we imagine, how we hope, how we dream, how we are intimate, how we grieve. We are not together, you and I. You are there only in my imagination as I write. And you're there now on my screen, in your homes, offices, cafes, parks, asleep in your early hours and watching this after the event. I feel a desire to know where you are, what's with you, what you can hear, what you feel. I write and now read into this online void to have the sense of others, you with me, as if we were in that space together in Dublin, sharing coffee, wine and laughter in those liminal conference spaces. Join me, travel here to Edinburgh instead for a few minutes. Join me as we make our way through the three sections in what follows, as I walk, talk, move, feel right around the city streets, in my home and in my office in the early part of the year in winter. And then in the second part, as I meet my therapist. And finally, as I walk, talk, move, feel right again, as the city turns to spring. Part one, December 2020 to January 2021. Lockdown diary, walking, talking, writing. December 31st, 2020. This is a beginning, a beginning in chaos and flux, in between worlds, in worlds where nothing is as it was or as it seems. There was a moment this afternoon on the cobbled street curving downhill to the water of Leith when I felt stable and still, strong, solid, rooted. I wasn't slipping with wary steps over a thin disguised layer of ice, nor treading an uncertain present towards an uncertain future in an uncertain world. I felt for that moment, that movement and accepting of this, that here I am, 60, in good health for now, employed, loved, loving, solvent, accepted, also white, male, middle-class, salaried, enabled, markers of privilege inscribed into that slow motion gesture of a hesitant body running down a wintry Edinburgh hill. The turmoil of the world, our coronavirus companion species enjoying its freedom to multiply and infect, doing what viruses are meant to do, changing and adapt, 
acting as it moves through the human species seemed to quiet, seemed to recede. Turning right onto the path alongside the brimming river, stepping past the terrier and retriever greeting each other, my own losses of this week, of this month, this long year receded too. A time when what had been possible became not so, a future imagined becoming erased in moments of touch and breath, the virus's success locking us down, locking us in, separating us, separating all of us from those we love and haven't seen for many months, or for many, for so many, not, separate, not separating us just for now, but taking them, taking them away from here, from them, from us. The poet Tishani Doshi writes about the art of losing. She writes, all our lives we are taught to let go as if loss were inevitable and things replaceable. The letting go demanded of so many during this year was surely not inevitable and all of it irreplaceable. Disease is never neutral, treatment never not ideological, mortality ne never without its politics, claims poet Anne Boyer. Doshi argues we are schooled to accept loss. You're expected to be calm about the fact that you'll never see the dead again. We shouldn't let go so easily, she seems to be saying. Letting go is a council of passivity and acceptance. It's political. Holding on is necessary, even if futile, just, even if exhausting, even if impossible. Because holding on means we're not colluding with the loss being just how it is, just ours or someone else's turn to fall into that same oblivion with nothing, as if it were nothing. As I turn towards home along Cumberland Street, I stop running and walk. I am, we are not letting go easily, not yet. I have to, but I can't, won't. We can't, won't. There is not only acceptance. There is anger amongst the stillness and the silence and in the cheering and clapping for frontline workers, grief, including its rage, is endemic. Monday, 25th of January. Yesterday, I left home before dawn, closing the door behind me and walking up the steps to where snow lay covering the pavement. I placed gloved hands into coat pockets, my hood lifted to cover my head from the continuing snowfall. I walked in the snow muck sounds of the few cars cautious movement. I met my friend Ross at the junction of Hanover and Queen Streets. We walked through the city centre heading east and soon after Waverley Station and the end of Prince's Street we began the short climb onto the Carlton Hill. There were others like the three women running who said hello as they passed and a man walking his excited dog but the snow was largely untrodden. I looked out as the darkness began to lift to the new whiteness of Salisbury Crags, Arthur's Seat beyond, and north across the Firth of Forth to the hills of Fife. Tuesday, 26th of January. I'm walking over the cobbles on one of the lanes. The lanes skirt the residential streets, running parallel along their sides, narrow and surprising. I pass a house for sale set down from the road and on the opposite side, a plot that's been cleared within the original walls 
metal railings guarding the earth upturned by the beginnings of foundations. There is unexpected bird activity and sound. It's January. Even after months of owning an app to recognize bird calls, I can't place them. A cat, a tabby, sits poised on the windowsill opposite the trees where the birds are gathering. This is the fourth week of lockdown. Finding the new is, is a challenge, yet uncertainty is pervasive. It's sewn into the clothes I wear. It's tattooed onto my skin. It's in my bone marrow, even as the root taken is the familiar cobbles of an ordinary late January morning. In the evenings, I've taken to kneeling on yoga blocks, gazing at a candle. My intention is to meditate into the uncertainty, into the feeling of not knowing, of not knowing where this will end. I remind myself there never is an ending, only a constant irregular rhythm of folding and unfolding. Wednesday, 27th of January. This morning's walk up the mound halfway towards my office is in fog. I'm on a Dickensian set or in a Rebus novel. Ross has just responded to my text to warn me to not get murdered. I'm short of breath as the incline steepens. There is traffic, but it's light. Only a few others are walking. I feel the effects of the physio's hands on my neck and back. I feel looser, lighter. It may be temporary, but I am appreciating it while it lasts. I work to understand the tension, what the stubborn knot in my muscles, tendons and ligaments is, what the pain is telling me about this time. A friend texts to tell me she has COVID. She's fearful. I go to reply to ask her how she thinks she caught it. I realize this inquiry would be born of my own fears. Tuesday, 28th of January. I'm 10 minutes into my walk up to my office. I'm at the busy junction of Hanover and Queen. I'm waiting for the lights to change. They're on a timer since the pandemic, so you no longer have to press the button to cross. These are dangerous times. It's risky to press a button others might have touched. Touch leaves lingering traces. I wasn't planning to do this today. I usually stay at home on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but the sudden prospect of a day full of online meetings, five in all at home, closed in on me when I got up. I need this walk and it's writing, talking. On George the Fourth Bridge, I traverse the narrow path marked by cones running beneath the scaffolding outside the Radisson Hotel. There are six men in high-vis jackets and white hats calling to each other, laughing as they pass gear. I'm talking writing as I walk past. One looks at me and imagines, I assume, I am talking to someone, which I am. It's early, not yet 9 a.m. and no shops are open. Few would be open in any case, only the pharmacies, grocery stores and cafes offering takeout. But it's too early for most cafes. When they open, the baristas will position themselves in the doorway behind perspex screens. There's a man at the meadows as I near my office, who is sitting on the ground, legs crossed, each morning as I pass. He's moved in recent weeks, perhaps in response to reduced pedestrian traffic. He now sits at the junction of paths on the north side of the park. Previously sat, he sat at the shops on the path leading to the junction. He's been there for the years I've worked from my office. I walk past him each morning and he's still there when I walk home at night. He calls to us as we pass, a word, 
two words, a phrase. The words are not English. I don't recognize the language he speaks. He nods his head, he nods his head at me. Hi, he says. I'm a few paces beyond him and he resumes his call. He will remain there all day as the snow lies on the ground, the temperature a few degrees above zero. You are in this writing. You're with me in every step, in every word I dictate, each letter, each word. You're here in these paragraphs. You are, you will be elsewhere throughout a constant absent presence. It's 11 a.m. Walk with me. Walk with me now. I've finished talking with a group of delightful master's research students about their dissertations. Walk with me after my hour and a, hour and a half on screen. Walk with me as I head down the curved, narrow staircase from my office and outside to the meadows. As I walk on the, on the tarmac path, past these two women out with their brown, curly-haired cockapoo. Walk with me as this strong runner comes towards me. Hear her breathing as she passes. Walk with me in today's icy January air. Walk with me through this writing. We won't be long. I need to get back for another meeting in 30 minutes, but it will be enough time for us to walk. Maybe we'll brush shoulders or laugh or huddle together into our tighter, into our coats as we cross the park, crunching through the snow carpet. Let's walk over to get coffee from my favorite cafe and its owner, Matt. We'll talk football with him for a little while. He's a Spurs fan, so we can banter with him about their problems. And then we can take our coffee, whatever it is you'd like this morning, flat white maybe, or peppermint tea and long black for me. And we can talk about how we are, how our work is, how our play is, how our lives are flowing. Walk with me, stay a while. Part two, March, 2021. An office, therapy, and a meditation on how. I'm writing at my keyboard and screen, eyes closed, a practice I've learned from writing alongside Dan Harris and watching them write at the blue metal tables on the Illini Union Terrace in Urbana, Illinois, sitting on the grass in Melbourne parks and on sofas in Edinburgh apartments, fingers on keys, keys pressing up against fingers, words arriving as they, fingers and keys, keys and fingers, move together in an interplay of human and non-human agency, a dance of agency. On my right wrist, two bracelets, one leather with a silver clasp, one a silver bangle, both gifts, both reminders, both gestures of love, still and moving, still and moving in rhythm on the memory foam rest as my wrists shift position. The bracelets are always together. They meet each other on occasion in the sound of silver on silver, engaging with each other in the formation of these words. The, here the hyphens, yeah. The text fingers, typing, bracelet, wrist, wrist rest, writing, eyes closed, machine, finds the word, how. The machine pauses there. We stop there, affected by the possibilities of how, by its three letters, by its singular placing, my eyes remain closed. They must to feel it, to pay attention to this one word, how. How offers openings, not closures, invites possibilities, not fixities. 
how draws us to happening, calls attention to process, slows the world down. Not how to, not the instrumental how to do something, but the how of the event, the moment of inquiry. How is this taking place? How is this possible? How is this? The moment, hexaity, thisness. How as a creative relational intervention in the present, a noticing of the power of the vital movement of creation. How the world seems so quiet beyond the sash window of my office on the university campus. How the leaf buds of the white beam tree are moving in a wind I can't feel or hear. How the sounds of activity on the meadows, sharp and vivid just a few moments ago when I was walking, are now muffled. Only the callings and laughter of the children audible from here. How outside the children in their green high-vis vests were impossible to ignore. Two boys kicked a ball between them, one always sending the ball away from his friend, who without complaint chased after it, brought it back, and they did it all over again and again. How solitary I am. How solitary in this building I have been these past lockdown weeks. The only person here in the company of the tight pirate spiraling stairs that echo as I climb, the sloping floors, the leaking ceiling. How my being here has been sailing close to the wind of defying university guidance. But how I've had to be here to get out, to get away from the sense of confinement of home had to, how it has been about survival, how solitary I have been walking here each morning, how hushed the city has been, the speed and bustle of early weekday city mornings long gone. How later I am not writing and Catherine is here. It's therapy day, therapy time, I have been waiting for her, eyes closed again, breathing deeply. I hear the microphone click of her arrival on Zoom and I look up to the screen and she greets me. Hi, Jonathan. There's a pause. How are you today? She asks. I hear the how of her question pulling me into a different shape. I see her long dark hair, her glasses, her calm, steady look at me. I hear the softness of her Scottish accent. We haven't spoken for two weeks. Hearing and seeing her has an impact upon me, affects me. I feel present, connected. How in the days when we could meet face to face before this current lockdown, I would take the bus from near home to the beach suburb where she lives. I would go early so I could walk by the sea, get a coffee overlooking the beach and watch the dogs being thrown sticks and balls, the walkers leaving marks in the damp sand where the waves break and the swimmers like selkies heading without fear and without clothes into the bracing water. How walking to her rooms from the beach cafe would take me 10 minutes and I would always arrive early and would hover in the park, cross the road under the cover of a tree if it were raining, which it often was. She would open the door to me, welcome me, and I would enter, turn left into the therapy room, place my bag and my, my coat on the floor and sink into the sofa, breathing in the sense of possibility. How is it you are here, she might ask. How is it to be here? How is here? How it's been 20 years since I was last in therapy. I finished when I finished my training. I realized early in working with Catherine that this is the first time I've been in therapy because I know I need it and only because I know I need it. For those few years when I was training, I could offer the rationale, 
make the excuse that I was in therapy because I was in training. Now there is no pretense. Now there is only raw need, need over these few months I cannot avoid or ignore. How at the screen today, I begin with the small, slow things. I look out at the darkening sky as if what I'm looking for might be there, as if out there over the Pentland Hills, I'll notice what's here, rising, moving through me that I can find words or movement for. A gesture with my hand in front of the screen or may maybe headphones permitting, I could find it by standing and letting the body's movement take me. How she will see it though, whatever I do, whatever happens, how she will notice, even from there, from her chair in her front room on this rectangular screen frame, how she will see, how she sees me. I speak about what it feels like to stand, to walk, to reach, to pick up a cup from the side, how it's there all the time. How she invites me to speak more about, to feel further into the it that's there. How the screen image, the amplified speaker sound conveys how she wants to know, wants to hear as the laptop rests on my table by the window, as the rain begins to tap against the glass, how alive this slow, fast moment feels, this post-human subject as creativity, this Zoe. How I say, well, I could call it pain. How it's pain, but it's more than that or not only that, or not quite that. How I tell her that some mornings like today, this Friday morning, I feel it more, more intensely. How I feel it as grief today. I feel it as absence. It's not pain exactly, it's, it's a space where once the other was, still is. How I don't feel it as regret, nor only loss, or even loss. There is relief, there is the memory present of joy shared, but there is this absence, grief. How I say I'm writing, how I write as I move, as I walk, talking into my phone, and writing, talking is taking me somewhere, releasing something finding something, how I say I've written a poem about a walk in the rain, just walking, an everyday lockdown walk. It's what I can do, how my umbrella and me, the small and the slow, find a poem in the rain, seeking creative relational connections amongst the spread of unruly, incommensurate forces, forces like a virus, forces like grief. An umbrella and I go for a walk. It was raining as I opened the front door. So I took the only umbrella I could find. I opened it on the street and realized it was the one with red transparent hearts. The umbrella, its hearts and I took a wet Saturday afternoon walk along the rushing waters stopping in Dean Village at the lookout to watch the river tumble over the weir. I held the umbrella tight because it wanted to leap in and surf the flow. Or maybe that was just the wind. 
We turned left to climb the steep cobbled lane to the bridge, crossed the busy road and followed quiet Georgian houses and their big windows, glimpsing the young woman at her two screens and the father and son in a kitchen playing a board game. An anxious man retreated three steps in front of his house to avoid us, my umbrella, its hearts and me. Another, eyes down, skirted onto the road, the virus making us all wary. And then we were home, but the umbrella got stuck and wouldn't close, so I left it outside, open, broken, hearts running red with rain. How the poem moves between us, between, here the hyphens, us on screen and through speakers on a table here by the meadows and there on a stand in her room, I am not in, but am. How the poem flows, lands, moves on elsewhere, the umbrella opening above us, between us, a refrain, an improvisational creative expression before it fades, its work done for now. How it becomes time to finish, how it becomes time to click leave on the red button, how I wait for her to go, how the screen tells me she has gone, how she remains present, the traces of our encounter making it possible to wonder how, how it happened, how it was possible, how it makes more possible. How the rain continues, staccato against the window. How I stand, stretch my arms to the ceiling, take my coat and scarf. How I pick up my umbrella. How this one is blue and has no hearts. Part three, April 2021, lockdown diary, walking, talking, writing. Friday the 2nd of April. Some days I don't want to talk right while I walk. I want to listen, listen to the sound of the single bird in the bare tree, to the bus approaching, to what is passing, has passed. I want to listen to what's happening in and through my body. I want to pay attention to the joy of the moment the joy of what it feels like to walk uphill, to breathe in deep the mild morning air, to listen to what's possible, what is present, what is here. I stop for a moment to check the dictation on the phone and laugh at how it has misunderstood. I stand still and correct what it's done, its own mind, its own intention and then regret not keeping the sentence I've just deleted. My phone, which is ancient, advises I have low battery. So I start walking again without writing, talking and listen. Listen to the dance, the unfolding, the resonance of it all. Tuesday, the 6th of April. It rained on my home to office walk. I had to use my umbrella, the blue heartless one, and couldn't hold my phone to write talk while also keeping it dry and holding the umbrella. I'm catching up on the writing talking I didn't do in the rain in my office, looking south across the meadows through the branches. I can see the roofs of Brunsfield, but beyond nothing. On a clear day, like therapy day, I would see the Pentland Hills. Today, it's just cloud. The building is silent. I saw one person ahead of me entering the building. The first time I've seen someone else here while we've been in lockdown. We didn't say hello. We kept our distance. It's the end of the day, it rains on, the umbrella is, again, is up, 
The umbrella is up again, but this time I have found a way to hold it all. I phone Ross. He walks with me down the hill from my office. He is my writing talking on this journey. Video calls are too much and too little, and we have too many of them. Hearing his voice and only his voice is more intimate, more full. The sense of him in my ears, his brightness, his melancholy, his laughter, shifts me, connects me, catches me. We talk about work and writing. We talk about walking and loving. We talk about the small lives we are each leading and their expanses of affective experience. We talk about how there is always movement, that feelings shift, how we are grateful for what is possible. When we finish talking, I change and head out into the wet for a run. Looking south from Inverleith Park, standing under the high bars again, I find myself noticing the pain once more. I feel it and allow myself to keep feeling it right there beneath my sternum. I look across to the castle as the sky darkens. On the run home, I stop by the water of Leith underneath Stockbridge and roar above the rushing waters. It's as if grief arrives from somewhere else, churns, and then moves on. Everyday life, writes Kathleen Stewart, is a life lived on the level of surging affects, impacts suffered or barely avoided. It takes everything we have. Wednesday, 14th of April. On the mound, some of the slabs on the pavement dip, making walking uneven. Twigs blown from the trees in the wind are scattered across the path. There's a steep grassy bank sloping down from the theology school. The robot lawnmower that should be patrolling is not there today. Its absence worries me. The grass needs cutting. On George the Fourth Bridge, the sun casts shadows through the scaffolding into the hotel behind it. I can feel the spring in the obvious, in the brightness of the sky, in the warmth with a slight chill on gloveless hands. I can feel it in the bird song above the light traffic. But I also catch spring in how it moves, how despite so much being the same as yesterday, last week, last month, Despite there still being no shops open, so few people around, the masks, despite all of this and the news of new variants, something has shifted, is shifting, in me at least. Grief remains around and within in every step, in every breath, but something else is also there, spreading, connecting infecting, affecting, hope, strength, determination, a will to life, to learning, to justice, to intimacy, a refusal to let go. Friday, 22nd of April. During the night, I woke up alert, I take it there is a part of me that feels afraid, unable to rest. I'm failing to notice all I feel. I'm failing to notice myself. I woke afraid of what is not there, afraid that I am not listening to what I feel, muscles taut, breathing shallow. I was unable to go back to sleep for some time, but I stayed listening, wanting to pay attention, wanting to understand. I walk around the meadows at lunchtime. Three young people are sitting on the grass, two with violins, one with a guitar. They are playing. They're playing folk music into the day. 
I stop, lean against a tree, feeling the bark against my hair and take it in. I thank the musicians when I leave. The man who sits on the walkway through the meadows and calls, who has been there every day these past years, is not here today as I pass. I realize he hasn't been here for days, maybe weeks. It's taken me this long to notice.